and I'll make you host. So, and we're recording, so you're all set. Okay, great. Uh, so seeing a presence of a quorum of the Town Council Committee on Town Services and Outreach, I am calling the meeting to order at 5.31 p.m. I'm gonna start by just checking in with my colleagues on the committee to make sure that we can hear you and that you can hear me. Uh, so George. I'm present. All right, and Andy. I'm present. Okay, we have uh, one member who we know won't be here today. That's Councillor Dumont um, and Councillor Brewer, I, we expect, um, but we are gonna get started. Um, I, here's a text from Councillor Brewer, hold on. Her Zoom is updating. So she will be here as soon as her Zoom finishes updating. Um, we have traditionally done two uh, periods of public comment, one at the beginning, one at the end. Um, the agenda shows it at the end right now, but I am going to um, move that up um, since I do see we have some public present who might want to comment on a specific issue, and I don't want them to have to wait until the very end of the meeting. Um, so at this point, if you would like to make a public comment on an issue under the jurisdiction of the Town Services and Outreach Committee, uh, please raise your hand. Okay. Oh, so we have one. Uh, so um, public comments on matters uh, are about matters in the jurisdiction of the TSO committee. Uh, residents are welcome to express their views uh, for one to three minutes. Uh, the TSO will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. Uh, so at this point, I am going to uh, bring in uh, Joanne Griswold. Uh, I think actually, Athena, you have to do that since. Oh, wait, I am host. Allowed to talk. All right. Uh, Joanne, can you hear us? Can we hear you? You might have to unmute. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Go ahead. I live at 48 Kendrick Place. I've been here. My husband and I bought the house in 1979. And we've seen a lot of changes as far as people owning and others buying and renting the houses. It at times seems to me that it is a forgotten street. In that 25 to 30 years ago, I was speaking with the then chief of police and I had spoken with a town manager. There were problems with parking on this street, particularly when there were events going on at Amherst College. Of course, they have taken care of that now, and that's not a problem except on moving in days or possibly reunion when weekends when someone does not want to uh, park in a distant parking lot. But the parking is on both sides of the street is abysmal. That's an abysmal um, allowance. There is not room for two cars on the park on each side of the street um, to allow some traffic through, as well as certainly emergency vehicles, utility vehicles such as recycling and garbage pickup trucks. A week ago Monday, the recycling truck could not get through because the parking on the street was very heavy. I wish to add that you do not need to have parking all the way up the street on both sides in order to prohibit someone from getting through. Uh, later on that same week, three days later, a different recycling truck uh, trying to get to an apartment house, I believe, could not get through because one car <clears throat> at 50, I believe it was 50, Kendrick was parked right across the street from the house opposite. Uh, the recycling truck could not get through. He sat there and blew his horn, and I believe at that hour of the morning awakened a number of people on the street who possibly had later classes or um, work, had worked all night. Finally, somebody exited from one of the um, buildings and moved his car into his driveway. 
usually it isn't caused by people who live here. Normally it is people who are looking for a place to park and they certainly have a right to park here. It's unrestricted. Um, a policeman told me one day when I could not get through to my own house, this was a number of years ago, when my husband was ill, I was anxious to get home. I could not make it down the street because the um, marijuana extravaganza was going on. And the cars, <clears throat> other traffic was taking a shortcut down through Steinbeck's business. Cars coming down the road were just lined up bumper to bumper could not back up. There were three of us trying to get down the street. We could not move. This was something that should not happen. I asked a policeman who happened to be there if something could be done about this. And he said, no, the parking is not restricted. The only thing I can do is park a car going in the wrong direction. I think that, um, we ought to take care of this before there's a tragedy. It's a rather forgotten street and we had to wait two years for a massive pothole to be filled. This was a few years ago. I, you know, I think we're all paying our taxes. Even the people who are renting houses out to others are paying their taxes. And I think we deserve more. I think there needs to be attention to this street I think there needs to be parking on one side of the street only. That might avert a tragedy. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Are there any other uh, members of the public who would make a, like to make a public comment? You can raise your hand now. Okay, so seeing none, we're going to return to our agenda. Um, we are going to start with uh, town manager appointments filed with the town clerk, and we will start with the uh, recreation director. So at this point, I'd like to give the town manager an opportunity to introduce his appointment um, to lead Amherst Recreation. Uh, thank you, Evan, and uh, thanks for having me tonight. So I am really pleased that I have forwarded the name of Ray Harp. Um, to the town council for its review as the town's new director of Rec recreation director. Um, Ray has been a fixture in the city of Northampton, both as a social studies teacher and as a coach of their basketball team and also their uh, girls lacrosse team and girls field hockey team. Um, he's beloved and um, has established quite a reputation within the community. Um, in addition, he has run the uh, Western Mass Basketball Camp in, in Amherst under uh, the name uh, with uh, Coach Hickson of Amherst College. Um, and so he has a broad range of experience um, in various aspects. Um, we were pleased that he was interested in this position. He's looking for a, a career change. Um, in terms of looking at the next phase of his life and looking at what he would like to work on and accomplish. Um, and this seemed to be a good fit for him. We conducted a pretty thorough um, recruitment effort to ensure we had the broadest, largest number of people, broadest uh, array of people that we could interview. And we had really strong candidates throughout the process. Uh, Ray is a graduate of Amherst College um, and also holds a master's degree in education from the university. Um, so, and you have the, the appointment memo with details with, with which was revised later in this afternoon uh, in recognition of the um, comments that Councillor Brewer made, which I had neglected to include, which I have included. And then uh, ultimately, um, thanks to um, Athena O'Keefe for making sure that, that the personal information was redacted. So if there are questions, I'm ready to answer them. Okay, are there any questions from members of the committee? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, so if there are no questions, or comments, comments. All right, then we can just move to a motion. Uh, so I will move that we recommend the town council 
approve the appointment of Ray Hark as recreation director. Second. second the motion. Okay, we have a second from, I think George got there first. We also had it from Andy. Um, any further discussion? Alyssa. Just double checking, it's effective immediately, right? As soon as the town council acts. Yes, Paul. Yes, it, we anticipate his first day would be September 22nd, which would be, he would need to give, yes. Any further discussion? Okay, then I'm gonna call the question. We'll start with Alyssa. Hi. I vote aye. George? Aye. And Andy? Aye. Okay, that is unanimous. Our next appointment is for, uh, I believe it's six individuals uh, to the African Heritage Reparations Assembly. Uh, so again, I'll ask the town manager to introduce uh, these appointments, then I'll ask the committee for comments and questions. Uh, thank you. So uh, I have put forward six names. One is, according to the charge, to be a representative from the reparations for Amherst, and uh, Michelle Miller is that designee. Um, and then there are six, uh, there are five other people uh, who've been uh, put forth uh, Jamela Jemison, Heather Lord, Alexis Reed. Irvin Rhodes and Amalkar Shabazz. And there's one vacancy that uh, we're going to continue to recruit for, uh, for that last seat. Um, the requirement for under the charge is that uh, five of the black, of the six res be black residents and all um, five of these um, uh, nominees or appointments uh, self-identify and I put in exactly how they self-identified in their community activity form in the um, in the memo so you could see how they self-identified. Um, this is a, an important committee um, and in, and so um, one of the things that's different about this is that um, I asked a small group interview team that was led by uh, Keisha Dennis of the um, um, Residents Advisory Committee, who has interviewed many people, along with uh, Barbara Love and Sid Ferreira, to conduct the interviews. And um, this, this is, you know, and I had conversations with them after their interview process, and these are the names I'm putting forward. Thank you. Are there questions or comments from the committee? Andy. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the, the only question I have um, is just thinking ahead of a possibility. Uh, one of the candidates is um, also somebody who is running for town council. And uh, we just had this discussion regarding ECAC as to whether it's appropriate to have counselors uh, serve as members of active committees. And uh, so I um, makes me uh, uh, at least ask the question as to whether there was any discussion with the, that candidate um, as to the possibility that um, the choice would have to be made if she um, is elected and uh, whether um, we as a committee have any comments about that general issue. I, th I think there may be actually two candidates in this group. Yeah, I, do you have any response, Paul, or shall I go to Alyssa? No, we, that, was, that was not an explicit part of the conversation. I think it's a really good point though. Okay, Alyssa. So I have many thoughts about this and I won't belabor it all night because I imagine it'll come up again at town council. I actually consider this to be completely different than the ECAT conversation and completely different than the ESB, the elementary school building committee conversation. And it's for this reason. When we created 
ECAC, we thought in our wisdom as brand new counselors that we wanted to put counselors on it. We stuck with that. We've even stuck with that through January, despite the fact that the majority of the council thought it was a bad idea. They decided to stick with it through January so as not to change horses midstream, et cetera. And then the charge is changed to say there won't be, it doesn't say counselors anymore. This is a completely different situation. And I will explain to you why. It is completely different because one, none of these people have been elected yet. Secondly, this charge specifically, specifically calls out asking for people of African heritage who are currently or formerly elected at-large officials. That means that if we currently had a town council member of African heritage, which we do not, but that if we did, that person could absolutely have been appointed to this committee and that would not have been a bad thing. Now, maybe if we had an African heritage person on the town council right now, counselors would not have agreed to have that specification about two of the members, but that's neither here nor there. So either your problem is with the charge that you approved under the circumstances that you approved it and you wish to change the charge in January, not now for January, which you know I objected to vociferously over ECAT, or you don't have a problem with it. It is a completely different scenario. It would be, shall I say, ludicrous to say that given that Michelle Miller has been, and, and Matthew of course as well, have been the two prominent members pulling us along with reparations to say, oh, but but we can't actually have a counselor, assuming she even gets elected on this committee because of an ECAT conversation we had. That makes no sense at all. If people are elected, and as was indicated, one of the other members that's listed here as a former elected official may be a new elected official, and another one, in fact, will be a new elected official, almost certainly, we aren't going to say, oh, well, it's okay for school committee members to serve that are currently school committee members, but it's not okay for town councilors to serve. That, I'm sorry, the logic just doesn't compute across those conversations. So I understand that it came up recently, but it's clearly a different situation. It is clearly different. And the idea that you would in any way expect someone to step aside now, either from elected office or from this appointed committee, who I might point out, we approved the charge for at the end of June and we haven't even staffed it yet, it being September and they have a deadline of October 31st that's actually gonna have to change. Just, it, it's a non-starter. The charge was written this way for a reason. If you have a problem with the charge, then you have a problem with the charge. You should not have a problem with the people who have been put forward here. And I appreciate um, also the comment Paul made while I have the floor here um, about the work that the interview committee did. And I liked, and I really appreciated the way he outlined the things they looked for in candidates. That was really helpful. So thank you. Other comments or questions about these appointments? Just to add my thoughts on, on that question, because I at first had a similar question to uh, Andy, um, but one of the things that I saw was, my understanding is that this is a temporary committee whose job is to develop a plan and then will dissolve, correct? Just making sure that I understand that. It's a, yeah. it's a, council, it's a council created committee, so. But that is our understanding of this committee, right? Mm -hmm. And so I view this in the same way that I viewed the uh, percent for art um, ad hoc committee that had a combination of counselors, but also members of the community to for a time limited period to develop something specific, whereas ECAC is a standing committee that will exist in perpetuity. Um, and so that is where I sort of drew the line as well. Seeing no other hands, I will make a motion, which is to recommend that the town council approve the town manager appointments 
of Jamila Jemison, uh, Heather Lord, Alexis Reed, Irvin Rhodes, uh, Amilcar Shabazz, and Michelle Miller to the African Heritage Reparations Assembly for a term expiring at the completion of the work of the assembly. Is there a second? I second. Okay, we'll give that one to we'll give that one to Andy. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're, we're slow tonight. All right. Any further comments? Okay, then I will. Oh, Alyssa. Um, I could have said this just as easily after the vote. Thank you. Is that I, I hope that the town, I know it's really difficult when we're already staffing so many committees. As you pointed out, we just had seven committees basically running at the same time the other night. So I, I understand how complex that is. But I'm hoping that given that you are still recruiting a member that you don't wait to let them get started meeting. And I'm sure they will be very welcoming of the next person. And hopefully it won't take too long to work through the next person. But I hope that they can get started again. Obviously, the October 31st deadline isn't going to work, but given that you know people have known about this since June, I'm sure that there's some pent up energy with people wanting to get started. So I hope that they'll get started soon rather than waiting for their final member. Yeah, so I think we were looking at the last week of September, I'm looking at my calendar uh, as, as trying to pull together a meeting. Um, I talked with Jen Moyston about that this, today. Um, and the other, just so you know that um, my last conversation with Barbara Love, it was, a, and she and um, Sid and uh, Keisha were going to be recruiting people that they felt would be a good match for this as well to get additional people in. Great, thank you. Uh, so for that, I'll call the question. And I vote aye. George Ryan? Aye. Andy? Aye. And Alyssa? Aye. That is unanimous. So we will move on to the appointments to the Community Preservation Act Committee. Once again, I'll ask the town manager to introduce the appointments. So I only have two appointments and these are designees from the Historical Commission, Hetty Startup and the Recreation Commission, Sarah Marshall um, for to fill those one year terms. Uh, the um, planning board, I think I mentioned my memo, they were supposed to vote on September one, but they didn't there. So now it's on their agenda for September 14th. And I think I didn't get a firm date, but I think it's the September 22nd. So I expect to be back to the to the TSO committee prior to your next meeting. Um, and we have one uh, additional seat and we have some applicants now that we'll have interviewed before then as well. Okay, we'll open the floor to questions and comments. Alyssa. It was about the last topic. I'll come back to it. I'm fine with these and I really appreciate the timing that, that Paul outlined for us. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, I will make the motion to recommend the town council approve the town manager appointments of Hetty Startup and Sarah Marshall to the Community Preservation Act Committee with terms expiring June 30th, 2022. Second. Thank you, George. Any further discussion? And I will call the question. We start with George. Aye. Andy? Aye. Alyssa? Aye. And I vote aye, so that is also unanimous. So for Athena, all three sets of appointments were unanimous. Thanks, Evan. Thank you, Athena. Alyssa. So I just wanted to ask, although I fear it's volunteering myself for something, but I just wanna ask and ensure that the TSO report does address the question that Andy brought up and that I obviously vociferously spoke to. Um, so because surely other counselors will have the same question because that's a fresh conversation we've had. I'm sure you'll do an excellent job of capturing that in the report. I am making a note of that now. But the only things I have, which is the Sharpie and a prescription. So hopefully I remember to find this later. Um, okay, so with that, we are going to move on to our next agenda item, uh, which is the public way request on Amherst College wayfinding signs. And so uh, this was the sole topic of our uh, 
uh, I believe the sole topic of our last meeting on August 26th. Uh, at that point, we had an updated presentation from Amherst College on their wayfinding signs. We also heard uh, some commentary from uh, planning staff on the signs. Uh, at that point, it became clear there was still ongoing conversation between Amherst College and planning staff, uh, and it didn't necessarily make sense for us to deliberate on the individual signs or locations at that point because they seem to still be in flux. Um, at, however, uh, at that point, Andy brought up the idea that we should at least agree upon um, how we are evaluating these signs, what our criteria and priorities are for when we get to that discussion. And so I wanted to have an opportunity for us to talk about that today. And so first I just want to hear an update from the town manager about where we are with those signs, uh, what, the conversa what conversations have happened since that last meeting between planning and whether he believes that they will, planning will be ready with a recommendation and that we will have a final list of signs by September 23rd. And then we will have a committee discussion about how we're going to approach that. So I'll start with the town manager. Thank you, Evan. So, yeah, the signs that have been proposed by Amherst College fall into basically three buckets. One, our signs are on their private property that are owned by Amherst College, and they are located in the general residential uh, zoning district. Um, and it's a couple and there are some other zoning districts. So these signs fall either they either need either meet the zoning requirements um, or that they need a waiver under the zoning bylaw for height, size, number of signs on a single property, things like that. So those are going through the normal process. The second uh, category are signs are in the ED zoning district, which are on the Amherst College campus. Um, the Amherst College presented the a general overview of the sign system to the planning board on September 1st, um, according to the zoning bylaw. And on that date, uh, the planning board uh, approved the ones that were included in the uh, special permit application. There are two others that need a new special permit application since they were not included in the first batch. So that those are neither of those groups uh, concern the town council. Um, the third bucket is towns are in the right of way, which includes the town common um, and on town streets. And these are the ones that you are being review that you are reviewing. Uh, some have been um, been reviewed by the design review board and the historical commission and the historical commission DRB has submitted their comments to the committee. Um, and let's see, uh, overall the hit for the historical commission, their review and recommendations were positive. They made a few recommendations on individual signs. Uh, the, the disability access advisory committee will review the signs at its meeting on September 14th. Um, so town, town staff through the planning department has been meeting with Amherst College. And one of our goals has been to distill down exactly what's on, what needs action by the town council and coming up with that de defined list in a way that is identifiable and actionable by the council. And so I know there's a meeting on Monday with Amherst College as well with the planning staff to make sure that we get that list comprehensive so we don't have to come back to you. Um, one of the things that's important to the college, for instance, is, is not only finding the locations and putting those locations and making sure our staff understands how they interact with our wayfinding science system and other science in the public way. Um, but one of the things the college has identified, and this is an accurate thing, is that, you know, you know, the wording on the sign may change over time. You know, if they relocate a facility or a building or something in, or want to change, if they change the name of a building, they, they'd like the signs to be approved by the council, but not the actual words on the signs necessarily. Um, so I think, you know, you asked, um, will we have a list and will it be ready for September 23rd? And I can say, yes, uh, we should have everything uh, approved, reviewed by the appropriate committees and a package delivered to you by the planning director by September 23rd. Great, thank you. Are there any questions for the town manager about those conversations, about the process or where we're at with those signs? Alyssa. 
Um, since I haven't actually watched the video and I'm just going to like ask you guys to just catch me all up, like in the next sentence, no, I'm not going to ask you to do that. But I do want to know if based on what you learned last time, there were any, if we were making a decision tonight, were there any particular takeaways that I need to be thinking of again, as I'm watching that video before our meeting on the 23rd, was there anything that really struck any of you as being challenging? Is that a question for the committee or for the manager? You're muted. But I think you're saying both. <laughs> Alyssa, you're muted. Whatever concerns remain from last time. So if, if staff expressed some concerns that you guys were, that you asked them to follow up on, or if you guys that met when I couldn't be here on the 26th expressed concerns that, you know, I should still be looking to be addressed by the 23rd, that would be super helpful. Okay. Uh, George. Um, Andy mentioned something last time in response to something I said, and I thought about it more, and I think he may speak to it as well, and perhaps better than I can. But I guess the thing that came away, that I came away from the discussion last time was the notion that um, at least one of these signs is going on uh, the town common, and it's a permanent alteration to the town common. So I guess that's something I'd like to hear more, especially from from the two members of our committee who've been around a lot longer in these affairs. Um, I was somewhat dismissive of that. And I think Andy caught me up rightly in saying, you know, that actually is something we really need to think hard about. Um, as far as all the rest of it, it seems we have a planning board, we have a design review board. Um, I would be interested in reading the reports from uh, DAAC and from uh, uh, who else are we getting uh, from uh, DRB. Um, but I'm not sure there's any value added from us um, with most of these signs, but the placement of one on the common is something I'd, I'd like to discuss a little bit and, and get some sense from the rest of you what you think. Um, so that was my takeaway. Thank you, George. Andy? So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, that is the reason that I raised my hand was the same issue and uh, it is a delicate and longstanding problem that we as town and Amherst College as a separate entity um, have never really come to um, a un full understanding about as far as I'm aware. And that is that there's a huge section of what is referred to as the South Common, which is part of the common, that has kind of been for all practical purposes uh, absorbed into the campus because it is on that side of College Street and the uh, um, college has been uh, pretty much, I think, now both taking care of it and um, acting for control purposes as if it's part of the campus. Um, for the most part, that has not been an issue, but there have been times before this that it has been, and uh, they are talking in this situation about putting a fairly substantial sign that is more than just something's hanging on a post. Um, it's really probably the most prominent uh, of the signs of all of them, and it is um, part of the public way. So um, I didn't dismiss it entirely as a non-issue because I do think that it is an issue. And I made a reference last time, uh, the meeting that Alyssa uh, was unfortunately not going to be, wasn't able to attend, about the bike share program because there became um, somewhat of a uh, um, misunderstanding amongst the college and uh, our town uh, staff that was working on the bike share program about the wisdom of putting a bike share location on the South Common on that side of uh, College Street. And uh, then when uh, it became um, a question for the college, it was dropped and 
uh, moved entirely to a new location. So it's sort of like this ongoing problem that's been around for a long time. And I don't know if uh, Paul has any comments about it or Alyssa because of her experience, but I was just uh, feeling like maybe this is a time that we should be thinking about um, coming to some better understanding amongst ourselves and uh, with the college about that particular issue and possibly some other issues that are um, part of our relationship where uh, this is an opportunity to have a, uh, a significant conversation. And I'll just conclude it with an example um, of a possibility, not anything that's I think been talked about at great length, but that is make um, it whether college parking lots at um, non-working hours can be made available for any town-related purposes where we have such an issue um, at those same times that they're not using the lots, but um, uh, people looking for parking. So that was the one issue that I think was kind of hanging there. Oh. So, yeah, I think that that's probably also list of the biggest issue. I mean, I think gen there's general agreement that the signs are very attractive and well designed. Um, there's there's general agreement that, um, you know, one, so currently there are these white wooden signs that demarcate the college campus, one on the octagon and one um, near at, at the other end of the common. I think there's some um, education and learning for members of the council and it may happen at the full council meeting as well that oh that's the that's the common most people have no clue but that 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 exists but you do um and that that's a that's a that's people just assume that it's uh property of the college the college does maintain it there have been agreements in the past apparently um where there have been some things but this is the one if we are going to demarcate the college campus starting at college street and South Pleasant Street, that that's a significant change um, and what implications that has either for ownership of the common, use of the common. I mean, if the council ever said, we wanna put the farmer's market on that part of the common, would that be something that you'd wanna entertain? And, and Andy brought up a real, a real life example of the, um, of the bike share um, and buses going through there and things like that. Um, you know, that's an, for PVTA, they are able to go through there as, as part of the, you know, as a public way. So, um, you know, Amherst College has been a really good partner throughout this. They are engaged in the conversation, um, more than willing to continue it. Uh, it's also an opportunity perhaps to clarify what is that relationship that has built up over time, um, you know, probably centuries uh, in this way uh, at this point in time. So, it's, but I think it's an important consideration for the council to make to make its decision. How, what do you want this to look like? George. Just a very small example and a really small one. But during the height of COVID, my wife was out walking with a friend. And when they parted ways, the friend wanted to walk diagonally across the South Common. And she was uh, approached by an Amherst College police officer who told her she couldn't walk across the Common because that was uh, campus uh, territory and the campus was closed to everyone except students and faculty. So just a very small anecdotal evidence that um, I'm not the only person who doesn't uh, have a full grasp of, uh, of the history and the actual uh, reality of the South Common. Thank you, George. Alyssa. I was waiting for you, Evan, to say what your concerns were. Would you like me to go first? Yes. Uh, so I, I think that, that uh, building on what everyone else said, that was probably my biggest concern as well, um, is that idea. Uh, I, was, I think I was in Georgia's camp, whereas when I first saw that, I went, well, that looks nice. And then as I started thinking about it, um, it does feel sort of a more permanent branding of, of town land. And I think I would want to understand um, 
what control we are we we maintain over that property um and making sure that it's clear that that is town land my other concern to add something new to the conversation and paul sort of mentioned this um in our august 26th meeting is making sure that we're not cluttering certain areas with signs um we have town wayfinding signs that are going up there's a whole bunch of other uh, navigational signs from the state since that's part state highway um and then of course now we have amherst college signs it sounds like amherst college not it sounds like it was clear from our last meeting that amherst college did move one of their signs to be farther away from town signs um and looking at the map in the most recent um presentation that they had given us at that last meeting it doesn't look to me like there is there are really any places where you have a town sign and Amherst College sign next to each other or really close to each other, but I, and this is relying on me reading that map. And so I would just want to understand from planning or from Paul whether there's anywhere where they feel like the Amherst College signs and the town wayfinding signs are too close or in conflict, um, or whether there's anywhere where we feel like there are just so many signs already and we don't want to add another one. So those would be my two primary concerns. Alyssa, would you like to go now? Yes, if I might, thank you so much. Um, one small thing about the parking situation, and I think it would be great to have an agreement with them about that. I think that that feeds back to all our conversations we've had about you know, what really is our parking situation in the town and who could we talk to about possibly using their lot at different times. But of course, we're also sensitive to the fact that that lot in particular, for example, is quite close to the recital hall. And so when I've gone to events at the recital hall on Amherst College's property, I expect to be able to park there because it's Amherst College's property on not on the common part, but on the parking part, rather than saying, oh, but because the fair's running right now on the Amherst Common, townspeople should just park there. It's like, hey, I want to go to the recital that's at Amherst College. So um, I think it would be useful to outline that, not just to assume that because it's after five o'clock, they don't use those parking lots because in some cases they do, although it's certainly not as much as we'd want to use them and we should be able to find a relationship there. So I think that's one part is that relationship. And then the other part is I don't see how and, and I really appreciate the thought you guys have already put into this. I don't see how we can possibly agree to let them put a sign on that common, that portion of the common without a legal agreement. And that doesn't mean a vote at the town council. That means a legal agreement that both our sets of attorneys have looked at. An MOU that says, this is what this can be used for. This is who takes care of it. This is who cuts the grass. And if and then we can say, if you want to put that sign in, theoretically, we can say, if you want to put that sign in, that's great. But if we tell you we want it gone, you have to take it out because it's not your property. And so if we don't do that, if we just say, well, you know, it's been this weird tacit agreement we've had for a long time and they always mow the lawn. And so I'm sure it's fine to put a sign there. Like, no, that puts us in a really awkward space for if they decide one day to start putting something up there because they don't know, like their policemen obviously didn't know it wasn't their property, although they're not likely to get out of backhoe and try and build anything. Um, just like they wouldn't appreciate it if we just went ahead and put a sign there. What if we put a sign there that said the farmer's market's over there? They wouldn't like that. And so I think we need an actual binding legal agreement, whether we call it an MOU or like we have with the Jones Library trustees, or if we call it something else, I don't see how we can authorize them to build what's clearly not just, you know, a pole in the ground with some concrete at the bottom that they could yank out. It's not just that simple in the common that belongs to the town of Amherst without some sort of legal agreement that clearly specifies who can do what when. And then we have the conversation about whether or not this particular sign is a good use of that. But just doing going ahead and deciding that the sign's okay or not okay in the absence of that legal agreement just doesn't make any sense to me in terms of our responsibility as a government. Thank you, Alyssa. George. So, I'm just thinking out loud, which is a very dangerous thing to do, but um, I'm going to enter into the spirit of it. I'm, I'm seeing sort of three 
options presenting themselves. Alyssa is making, I think, a very strong point that whatever happens with this at least particular piece of land, we really should come to some kind of uh, legal agreement that clearly states what what's what and what what the responsibilities are for um, the two parties. Um, and that, I guess, is assuming that the common stays under stays with us uh, and always will. Um, and so that was my second sort of strand of thinking, which is maybe that's just uh, another possibility is, I mean, if you put a permanent sign there, such as they're proposing, and it certainly makes sense given the geography of the campus and so on, but you're basically, we're basically making it clear to everybody that this is, you, you've reached Amherst College, even though it, according to, it isn't. Um, so is this something that can be, I guess the term is alienated? Can we, can we sell it? Um, is that even permitted? Um, so that's a second question, just thinking off the top of my head. Um, may we go to them and say, okay, if you're gonna put a sign there, a permanent sign, a one uh, that's gonna basically identify this is Amherst College land, um, you're gonna to have to buy that piece of land um, and we're not gonna sell it cheap. That's the second thought. Um, and the third is just a bargaining chip kind of along the lines that look, um, you want something, we want something. Um, so I still that, I think that goes along with the legal agreement that some kind of something should be put in writing no matter what. Um, and so a third option is, um, okay, we're gonna have to get a legal agreement here and try to clarify a few things if we can, but we also expect something back because we're giving you something really, really significant. Um, you want this badly, uh, we understand that, it makes sense, but uh, this is our land. Um, and so we expect something in return, um, not just a, you know, a smile and a handshake. So I guess there are three things in my mind at the moment. Um, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but I assume if we alienated it or if we sold it, that would be a whole nother question, but at least a legal agreement of some kind seems appropriate. And the thought that we should, if we're giving up something substantial like this, we should get something in return. Thank you, George. Uh, and Andy, you had your hand up and then went down. Did you, is there something you uh, want to I was, I was trying to decide because George is really covering a lot of what I was thinking about saying too. And we've had discussions with uh, the College of Times about various pieces of land that they own uh, or were seeking to purchase that were uh, not necessarily contiguous to their um, current campus. And uh, we've never really found a good way to have that conversation because um, they've not been willing to have that conversation. And so I, uh, it, it sort of felt like maybe this is an opportunity to establish some sort of understanding about how those conversations take place. Um, and the other is, I don't know if uh, either Paula or Alyssa um, as town manager or former chair of the select board uh, respectively, who were um, in their positions at the time that bike share was first established, um, have a better memory of the details of what happened with the uh, desire that we had to place a bike share location on the South Common and the opposition that arose from the uh, college to have the bike share location actually uh, uh, not exist on what was our property. Uh, George. Again, just briefly, what about a land swap? And, and as opposed to simply selling it, is, I'm just throwing these ideas out here, I don't know. But if we have a piece of land that really would be valuable to us, um, could we swap it for this piece of land? Could we say, okay, you now will have this piece of the South Common, but now we want something else. So that's another option, just a thought. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna ask if the town manager has anything further he wants to add on this topic. Uh, not particularly. I think that you've identified a lot of issues and then some um, for us to continue the conversation with the college. Okay, Alyssa. So then what I'm gonna ask for, if 
TSO agrees with me because obviously I as one individual do not direct the, pol- the town manager to do anything. Um, if we as a TSO would agree that in addition to all the other work staff is doing to prepare for September 23rd, what it would look like for the town council to take a position that encompasses some of the things we've been saying here about to direct the town manager to work with Amherst College to, you know, come up with some sort of legal agreement, to come up with an MOU, to come up with a land swap. I mean, something that would give, right, these directions, but would, you know, have an a big envelope that they could work within um, to have that conversation because it's certainly possible. I mean, I don't want to craft that on the floor when we get to town council. And it's certainly possible that I could be the lone voice that's concerned about it when we get to town council. And then, you know, you didn't waste any time creating a motion, but uh, I'd probably try and create it on the floor at the time because I'm not seeing a way that I can justify the town just agreeing to do this without any sort of legal agreement and without any of that more complex discussion. But yet I don't, of course, expect, you know, someone to have all the list of all the properties, sit down at the table, work out a land swap in the next two weeks. Like I'm not picturing that's going to happen either. But I also know that this is important to Amherst College to get going on this. So I guess what I'm asking for is in time for our meeting on the 23rd, that the town manager has had some time to think about if you're going to give me a direction to work with Amherst College on that, this, here's what the direction needs to look like for me to be able to do that. Okay. Any further comments from members of the committee? George. Again, just my, my sense here is that it's really this, this particular sign and this particular parcel of land that's of concern to this committee. Um, and the rest of it is not something that, that we have any strong feelings or views about. We, we're confident in what our plant, town staff is doing. We're confident in the planning board, et cetera. But this particular issue that I think Andy put his finger on last time is really something that we are concerned about. And we would like to have some further discussion and some ideas presented um, to us is what I'm hearing. Yeah, so I think, you know, um, to, to summarize this, it, it sounds like that is the one sign and that is the one issue that this committee has concerns about. Um, I did bring up the issue of sign too many signs in a location. And I, when we had our conversation on uh, August 26, um, the planning department went through and gave comment on pretty much every sign, um, whether they had issues with it or not. And I think what my um, what my, my request would be for our next conversation is, um, if there are particular signs that at the end of conversations with Amherst College planning department staff still have concerns or issues about, to highlight those concerns about those individual signs, I would like to hear if they have any concerns about any locations in particular with regard to sign clutter or interference with town wayfinding signs, but barring either of those to focus that discussion on this one town common side. I don't, I don't personally think I need to hear from staff if they are okay with the sign. I will assume they're okay with the sign unless we hear otherwise. Um, and that will allow us to focus our September 23rd discussion um, pretty much exclusively um, barring other issues on on this on this one sign and this one concern that we've seemed to coalesce around uh paul so, so that's really a good summary the um there are a couple places where there was sign clutter as you said and, and in fact in the conversations it might come to where the town with the planning department and, and amherst college say well actually the town sign ought to move it's already been approved by the council but it's in everybody's best interest for us to move the sign. So we would come back to the council asking to move our wayfinding sign because if the, the designers all say, no, it, it, the college should be first and whatever it is um, just to make it work. So, you know, that's one of the things that are on the table as well. Maybe we look at, we look at where we put our wayfinding signs and to accommodate this. Okay, thank you. George. I'm just noticing that we have Seth Wilschutz and Tom Davies in the audience, and at least one of them at earlier, I think two of them had their hands up. 
do you want to bring them into uh, the meeting um, and have a conversation with them? What's uh, what are your thoughts on that? I am open to hear from the committee. My intention of this discussion was for it to be a committee discussion mm -hmm. for us to identify what our concerns are and what we will be looking for um, in the September 23rd meeting where I will ask uh, and I believe they expect to be present uh, as panelists in that meeting and we also expect the planning staff to be there. Um, I would be happy for them to give comments as members of the public at the end of the meeting during our public comment period, but I did not intend to bring anyone outside of this committee in, but if committee members would like to hear um, from others, I'm, I'm also open to that. Well, we've had them present in the past. I don't personally have a problem with it, but I'd be curious what uh, Alyssa and Andy think. Alyssa, Andy, do you have thoughts? Alyssa, I know you have opinions. How would you know that? <laughs> um, I appreciate the way you delineated it and that you intended this to be, you know, an, uh, a TSO discussion, obviously held in public and didn't want to force Amherst College and planning department to come back to this conversation, right? That was part of the point is to not ask people to come back over and over and over again to hear every pearl of wisdom that drops from our lips, but um, in live time. But um, given, given that they're here, given that we would, you would add a public comment period at the end, what else did you want us to discuss tonight in terms of how long do we want to make them wait? And is, because I'm guessing there's no reason to say they can't talk. So um, if they feel like they want to talk, what's a good time given our schedule tonight? I think that's a good point. I had intended to just have one more public comment period at the end, but perhaps we don't want to make them sit through our conversation of a residential parking policy, uh, as exciting as I do anticipate that will be, Absolutely. and perhaps they'll stick around for it anyway. Um, but hearing what I'm hearing from Melissa and from George, uh, I will hold a second now public comment period. Uh, and so if you would, are in the audience and would like to give public comment, please raise your hand. And I'm going to recognize Seth. Seth, you should be able to speak if you unmute. Uh, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. I um, actually, I'm going to defer to, to Tom if that's okay. I, apologies. I'm just going to lower my hand, but I didn't get it down in time. No worries. He, he should be ready. Tom, you should be able to talk. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you uh, making that this available at this point. Um, as exciting as your next topic sounds. Uh, I probably won't join you. Um, but uh, all I was gonna say is that um, we, we do have quite a bit of um, history. I, I just heard uh, various um, members, um, you know, kind of wondering about history of uh, you know, bike share, of, of land offerings and different things like that. I think it probably doesn't make sense to talk to that, um, but um, we can document um, those pieces of information and um, send that over to whoever, whoever, I don't know if that flows through Paul, however you want that. Um, and I think that that might help to clarify some of the pieces that you are, um, you know, trying to, trying to remember or, or, you know, that might be relevant. That's all. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue to work with all the various uh, committees and, and uh, staff members um, as we have been. Great, thank you, Tom. And sure. uh, Seth, you, you're, you're still able to talk if you wanted to add anything? Uh, no, I, I think, um, am I, sorry. No, I think uh, Tom covered it. I think the, you know, I think we are, uh, are addressing the uh, clutter um, comments uh, with town staff. I, I think Paul, Paul's staff would agree with that. I don't think I'm out of line saying that. Um, and so I think we have another meeting with town staff, as Paul noted, Monday afternoon. And then we have one more meeting um, with the DAAC on Tuesday. I forgot what time that is. 
Um, and then I, you know, I think we will have met with kind of everyone and we will have, I know there's been some concern that there wasn't a consolidated list for you. That list exists. I just wanted to get through all of these um, meetings so that any uh, revisions that come from the meetings are all packaged and it's one final quote unquote list with the map. Um, and so we'll get that to you well ahead of the 23rd, um, you know, probably sometime kind of middle to late next week. And that's all I wanted to add. Great, thank you. Uh, so at this point, my sense is that the committee has at least um, a, a focal point for this, for this next discussion. We know what we're looking for. Paul, you know what we're looking for and what we're expecting for the next meeting from you and staff. Um, are there any final comments on this conversation before we move to our next agenda item? George. So we have no further uh, bodies that we want information from. We are, um, I believe we have DAAC that will have a memo from them or have already, and we'll have DRB um, and that's sufficient. There's no other entity or body that this committee needs to hear from. Um, there's a question, I think my answer is, I'm, I can't think of any. So I'm assuming no one else can either. I'm going to take the lack of hands as we are at, the, at, so by the 23rd, we will have recommendations, right? From the DAAC, from the Historical Commission and from the Design Review Board and from planning staff. So are there other places from which we want feedback or recommendations? Uh, Andy. Yeah, I just have uh, one question and that is uh, whether uh, there's any need to uh, at least check with the Commonwealth uh, DOT regarding their plans for Route 9 and whether there's anything that they have a concern about that they would like to express to the town. Has that question been asked to them? Paul? Yes, the college uh, has been in touch with the with the with Department of Transportation on that project. Thank you, Alyssa. Yeah, just to clarify, I don't think there are additional committees. I really appreciate Andy bringing that up because that is incredibly important. We all know what it's like when DOT just takes it into their head to just go do something without any discussion with anybody ahead of time. Um, is we haven't actually gotten the DRB comments yet, have we? Because I didn't remember seeing them, but I just want to make sure I didn't overlook something. I, I, I'll, let me double check, but I believe we had them in our August 26th packet. Um, planning staff had had given them both and then they had created a document for each sign where they provide a comment from historical and DRB. Yes. Okay, seeing no further comments, I'm gonna close this discussion. Um, and I think we know what we're looking for for our next meeting. And at that point, um, we'll expect to have planning staff and also Amherst College staff um, for a broader conversation and potentially uh, a vote and recommendation for the council. So with that, I want to move on to our next agenda item, which is the townwide residential parking policy. And this is uh, the, the uh, baby of, of Councilor Ryan here. And so I want to hand the floor over uh, to him just to sort of introduce or reintroduce. We, we, we've seen this before, Right, but it's been a, or some version of, we've seen some version of this, it's been a while. It's my prodigal son. Um, <laughs> it's, it's much too old now to be called a baby. It's, uh, it's been around for a while, to say the least. Um, it's ready to go off to college, I think, at this point. Um, I appreciate you taking it up or putting it on the agenda. Um, part of it was to give a, a nudge to uh, Guilford um, and see if he would have a chance to look at it and have some thoughts. Um, we all just got a memo from, and we just heard actually this evening from a resident of Kendrick uh, Place that gives us another example of 
the kind of parking issues that do occasionally bubble to the surface and do uh, come to us as keepers of the public way. And so uh, uh, originally this began with, Link, uh, with uh, uh, Lincoln Avenue um, and then the request was made by a number of councilors to really craft something town-wide, not just to be responding to one particular problem. And so that's what uh, Guilford and I worked on. And we basically, he presented a piece and I took a piece and we I kind of put it all together. And what you have in your packet is, is that uh, draft. It's just a draft at the moment. But the idea is that, that given having something like this, if we could come to an agreement and the council would agree to it, um, you know, when these kinds of issues do arise, uh, take the, the example of this evening, um, there would be a policy that would guide us and guide the public as to how we would go about dealing with it. Uh, the other thought I had was, and this is maybe going beyond uh, a little bit of what we want to talk about tonight, is that of course this process of parking and so on, keepers of the public way requires a public hearing. And in the past, we felt like that has to be the town council. And I think many of us feel that, that why does that have to be the town council? It could be TSO. TSO could easily hold that public hearing. Um, and so that's something else I'd like you to keep in the back of your minds. Um, so the policy is there. You've had a chance maybe to look at it, maybe not. Um, I would like to hear if possible from, I don't want to put him on the spot, but if Guilford's got some thoughts, um, if he's had a chance to look at it at all, um, it would, now's a chance for him to, to speak. Um, and then I, of course, I'd like to hear from my colleagues uh, what their thoughts are, but I have tried to respond to uh, the request of a long while back uh, to produce a, a policy document that if adopted would then guide us uh, and the council with these kinds of requests like Lincoln and Kendrick uh, Place and so on and so forth. Um, so those are my thoughts at the moment. Uh, thanks, George. Um, Guilford, do you, did you have anything you wanted to add about this? Um, no, not, not very much. I mean, we did worked on this together and I actually, um, there's a couple of things I got, um, there's a couple of things that are a little different, which is fine with me. Um, but if you actually, if this was the policy and Kendrick Place came to us and wanted to know, could they have parking or no parking on the street? Um, Kendrick Place is only 21 feet wide. So if we applied the criteria to it, we would have no parking on Kendrick Place because there's not enough room for parking unless we added extra space for the parking. Um, so that'd be a kind of a cut and dry, easy first look at it saying, hey, no, there shouldn't be any parking on the street at all because the road's too narrow. Um, it's only 21 feet wide. So you, could, you can't have parking on, you definitely can't have parking on both sides and two travel lanes in the middle. It's just not enough room there. So it, it's a good way to flush things out. I know there'll be exceptions. There's always exceptions. There's always extenuating circumstances that work into things, but it's a good way to start and to base Base your your primary and your actually your preliminary recommendation on it. So I, I like it and I, I think it would help us a lot. Okay, so I want to open up to questions and comments from the committee. Uh, before we do that, um, so my read of this policy, you have several sections of it um, that are labeled with Roman numerals. And it seems that sections one through three are about criteria that we would use to evaluate any parking change request. Whereas uh, sections four and five are about the role of the TSO and the role of the Transportation Advisory Committee, which so those are, are separate sort of very separate things, right? One is criteria and one's about the role. And so I think that uh, it's useful for us to have a discussion about both uh, the policy and the criteria that we'd be using to apply, but also what we see as the role of this committee and the council in that process, because those might end up being two very different conversations. Uh, so I'll open the floor and call on Alyssa. So here's my problem. This product is not in the public packet. It's only in the SharePoint. 
And I don't use the SharePoint except on a temporary basis while I'm waiting for it, you know, because sometimes, because we, we can put stuff in SharePoint. So we can do that at midnight. And then when staff comes in, they can put it in the public packet. It's not in the public packet. I'm back digging around in SharePoint to remind myself, oh yeah, that thing you looked at in SharePoint isn't in the public packet. So I don't like talking about documents at meetings that haven't actually been in the public packet that just are internal documents that, yeah, so I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, that that it, George. Well, that's a real problem. I agree. Alice is right. Um, I didn't think to check. Um, I use SharePoint all the time. Of course, I also have this document. I've had it for like six months or whatever. So, but I agree. It it really has to be <laughs> in the public uh, domain when if we're going to talk about it. So I guess that's a real problem. I will, I will take some responsibility for that. I asked George uh, to give it to me. He put it in the SharePoint packet, um, but I'm realizing now that I never said to Athena, hey, this has been added to SharePoint. Can you add it to the public packet? Because usually it works the other way around. Uh, Andy. Yes, I agree with the uh, point that was just raised, but I also don't think that it, uh, it would be inappropriate to go ahead at least have some discussion. I certainly would not feel comfortable taking action, however, tonight because I, it has not been in the public packet and has not therefore been available to the public for discussion. Uh, there have been several different things that came up uh, and, you know, the distinction between the role of the committee and the policy that was made I think uh, is important that we address uh, both eventually. I don't think that we necessarily need to do, do so tonight. I felt like um, as a memo, it was very well done and I appreciate it greatly, but it did have a little bit of a lack of clarity between whether it was an internal memo as opposed to a standalone proposed policy for adoption because there was pieces in there that talk about um, sort of things that the committee and the council need to consider. And that's not what a policy ultimately ought to look like. So I wouldn't uh, want this document to become the policy that we end up with um, uh, um, presenting for adoption because I don't think that it reads that way. I did have some small comments about policy that I'm not going to bother with because it wasn't disagreement with the policy. It was just, I think, clarity of language. Um, and um, I could come back to that in some other format. So I'm going to um, therefore be left with a couple of other issues. One is that I think that the Transportation Advisory Committee was dismissed too wholly from this document. I think that the TAC is uh, a very thoughtful, hardworking group, and I would rather have TAC at least have an opportunity to come to future um, TSOs and offer their um, input because they come at it um, with different expertise and different views. And uh, I don't think that it's ultimately a THC decision, but I do think that it's important that we hear from the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, and the other thing that I was um, somewhat um, uncomfortable with is that it was treating parking on residential streets separate from the issues that we've been talking about fairly significantly in this uh, community, and that is parking generally and availability um, and whether there's an ample supply of parking. And it becomes important because on a lot of residential streets that it happens to also be streets that have been used for permit parking. And, um, so that the relationship between this policy and the parking uh, discussion in general and the use of permits, the amount of permits we're going to issue 
and where they are best located for the purpose for which they're being issued um, end up really needing to come together if you're going to be thinking about parking in a holistic way. Um, so I was uncomfortable in the end with that as with that not having been touched on in the proposed policy that we were looking at. George. Good. Um, this is helpful. Um, I think, first of all, you're right that, that um, in a sense, it's all been put into one big package, but eventually this is going to have to be separated out. And if we do come to a vote at some point, which I hope we will, about a policy, some of this will, will not be in here. Um, but it's here for, I guess, it was put in here simply for everyone to think about. And, and uh, for instance, the question of, um, which we could talk about for a few minutes today if we wanted, is um, I think it's appropriate for this committee to, um, to be the agent through whom public hearings are held. I don't think that it's a good use of council time to have the entire town council convene a public hearing on a parking issue. Um, I think just as it's been done um, with other matters uh, through CRC and, and, and with TSO itself, that this would be an appropriate place for those hearings to be held. And then we report back uh, to the council. Councilors are obviously welcome to come to a public hearing and, and participate, but um, it would take a, a burden off the uh, council and put it, I think, in, in a place where it could be handled, I think, fairly well. Um, so I think that would be something that I would include, I think would be appropriate in the policy. Um, and that's why it's there for us just to think about, but other pieces need to come out, I agree. Um, the role of TAC, um, Andy, I completely agree that, that it would be wholly inappropriate for us to, um, or to deal with a parking question and not um, hear from TAC and not have a report from them. So this, uh, maybe I didn't make it clear enough, but my point simply was, at least in what I was trying to say, was that um, they should not have any formal role. They, they don't vote, they don't make a decision. But at the same time, we as uh, TSO would uh, make them a very important part of our process of referral. And we would expect and ask for a report from them and maybe even invite them to participate in the discussion. But so I agree with you on the role of TAC in that sense. Uh, I was simply trying to say that wherever this finally settles, um, it should settle with um, elected officials and most likely on a council committee, um, not with, with TAC, for instance. Um, so I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that they should be involved. It's just that ultimately the decision should be uh, up to this committee, up to elected officials. I'm a little, maybe you can talk some more about the permitting. Uh, this is really uh, meant to be focused on not solving the larger parking issue in Amherst, but just as Guilford mentioned, just dealing with the sorts of issues that come up like Kendrick Place or Lincoln Avenue. Um, I think Andy, you have a, a thought that you mentioned to me the other day um, in terms of one way streets and so on. This would be the place where that would come. Um, and then it could be presented by staff. It could be something that a counselor brings, it could be something a resident brings eventually, um, but it's here where that discussion um, eventually takes place and we make a recommendation, but it's really about the issue of parking um, and everything else. I, I, I guess I don't, I, you could add to the criteria of that uh, something like, you know, presence of permit parking in that area or something like that. Uh, it certainly should be taken into consideration, but I don't see any way that this policy document uh, could address, um, you know, where it should be or how ex what extent it should be or that sort of issue that seems totally out of um, what this policy is trying to address. So I don't have any problem with it as being a criteria to be considered when dealing with a specific uh, parking request, but I don't see how I, it could go into this as a policy document where we make statements, uh, policy statements about what we think um, about townwide parking as, as, as to do with permits or the downtown, things like that. So maybe you could help me clear, get clarity on that because I don't see a place for that in the policy as I've envisioned it, though I do see a place for it as, as a criteria to be considered along with, you know, I know like parking demand is what it says on the, on the, uh, in the policy document, uh, resident input, availability of off-street parking. These are criteria. And that would, I think, also include, you know, uh, the existence of permit parking and what role that might play. Andy? Yeah, 
Uh, I, actually, what I'm saying is, I think you're saying it's directly uh, responsive to the point George was uh, asking about. Um, some of the streets that I think are problems as far as applying um, when you look at this policy and whether uh, there's enough room in the streets or whether um, or not, are streets that have permit parking as um, part of the usage of the parking on that street. And um, I think, therefore, we can't ignore the fact that as we apply this policy, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't, uh, because there's been lots of thought and lots of good reasons, including one stated earlier today during public comments as to why this kind of policy is needed that it may reduce the number of permit parking spaces in town. And if it, um, that would be a result, I think um, it is the responsibility of the council and the committee uh, to be thinking about what, what, what does that mean? Does that mean that we can't have as many permits or that we need to find more permit parking Elsewhere is replacement, um, but we're going to change the criteria on permits in order to uh, reduce the number of permits issued. Uh, there are consequences, and to ignore the consequences of um, this policy uh, doesn't make me feel comfortable. George. So Andy, would, would adding a criterion such as, you know, consider in addition to X, Y, and Z, consider also the effect on uh, the availability of permit parking, something to that effect um, put into this as one of the criteria that we've considered when dealing with any specific request, would that uh, go some way to addressing your concern? Or are you asking for some kind of substantive statement in this policy document. Um, that's where I, I just, you know, I'm suggesting maybe adding something like that as a criteria to address your concerns. So that would be considered as part of, as the process as we go through, well, what effect does this proposed change? So take Kendrick Place. Um, Guilford says, look, there really shouldn't be parking on that street at all. Um, so if we had no parking on that street, um, how many permit places would be lost? I don't know, maybe none, maybe 10. But anyway, that would be something we'd look at and then we'd have to make a judgment as to whether that um, is something that, you know, merits. I mean, anyway, that's what I'm suggesting. Yeah, I'm not sure you. that Kendrick Place has any. I don't think it does, but I, I don't know. I don't think it does either. And uh, so it sort of makes an independent decision. Um, and I don't think Lincoln does either um, no. at this point. Um, because I think that the last permit places are uh, on parallel streets like that or on the right. North Prospect. Uh, but as you're dealing with various streets and going around the, the other side towards Amherst College and some of the um, streets that are uh, back in that section, I can't even remember all of the names of Dickens and Seeley, whatever they were. Yeah. Uh, they do have permit parking, and I think that there are width issues that could be legitimately discussed and should be discussed. Uh, but when you, if you start doing that, you then are reducing the number of permit parking, and that uh, to recognize it in the policy that uh, consideration is being given is to what the effect is going to be over the whole down, on the whole parking system and changes that might be necessary in the parking system uh, might be an appropriate thing to do as a, as a solution. Uh, because in the end, uh, I think that, that a lot of what uh, concerns all of us is that if uh, emergency vehicles can't um, get to properties where they need to provide services, uh, that that's a problem and not an acceptable 
uh, situation. And uh, so I think we do have to deal with it. George? So I just want to read the, the very last statement of the criterion section, which says that these factors, the ones that are listed above, and imagine adding to that something like the effect of availability on permit parking, Ad, imagine added that. But anyway, these factors that have just been listed above should be considered in evaluating any proposed residential parking request. It should be the totality of factors and not one single factor that should be decisive. Um, and then in, in, in recommendation or final council decision, they should be referenced in, 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 in making the case. Um, so in the case that Guilford mentioned this evening, um, maybe we could argue that even though by the strict definition of 21 feet or whatever, it shouldn't have parking at all, given the fact that it's basically a dead end street that has a number of residential buildings on it, um, you could, as long as you could get safety, you know, public safety vehicles and delivery vehicles and so on, you, we might say parking on one side is permitted. Um, so it, it, this, this is not meant to be rigid. It's meant to allow flexibility and to take into a multitude of factors. Um, obviously the width of streets is important and, 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 but, um, and Guilford can weigh in here. He might say, no, um, you know, that it's just, if it's not 21 feet, you just can't have any, you know, can't have one side parking. But the way I envision this policy and the way it's written at the moment is it gives a fair amount of flexibility um, but references specific criteria that should be used, including street width. Um, and so in the case of Kendrick Place, I could imagine uh, if that came before us and we had a uh, public hearing and we discussed it, we might, might possibly come to the decision that you could, uh, we would recommend putting parking on one side of the street, even though according to the strict definition, it's, it's not allowed. And then we'd make the case for why. We would say why we think this should be the case. Or we could say, you know, Guilford's made it clear that 21 feet is, is the limit and that just can't be done. So no parking at all. Other comments? So just, go, yeah, Guilford, please. I'm sorry. Guilford, yeah, I saw your hand. Um, I think actually taking into account the, the permit parking is quite doable. I'm. If you watch my head, I've got my chart over here on my right side. I've been going through figuring things out. Um, there's really only maybe three streets that actually have an issue with this requirement, and you'd have an issue with the, the permit. Uh, two of those streets are actually residential parking, not um, downtown center parking. Um, and residential parking was put in, in place for another reason. It wasn't put in place to actually um, provide parking spaces for people downtown. Um, so it, it's actually doable with some just, it's doable to make it work within this and within the criteria. So I, I don't really see a real big problem with that. George. So if I were to um, remove um, sections four and five and um, add the uh, suggestion of the effect of availability, uh, the effect on the availability of permit parking. Um, could this then come back? Would the committee be willing to have this come back to them sooner rather than later? Because it's really, it's been almost three months now. Um, uh, and, and then people, it would be in the packet where it's supposed to be and people could have a chance to look at it. Um, because I'm, what I'm hearing from Guilford is that it looks like something that he could work with I mean, Paul may want to weigh in at some point, maybe not this evening, but he may have concerns. But um, I'm just thinking practically, we have a resident who come to us this evening and has written to the council and, you know, they couldn't get there to, you know, the trash truck couldn't get through. So what happens? Um, it seems like that's a place where we should act, um, but we need a policy first. That was the request and I understand that. So we have a policy, I'd like us to move on it fairly quickly, I'm willing to, to tidy this up a bit and remove um, the sections that, that are not really related to a specific policy and maybe put in a separate document. And I would like the committee to consider whether they'd like added to this, um, the recommendation that public hearings be held by TSO with these matters, that they not be held by the town council. Alyssa. 
Um, I have to go back and check my notes from our last town council, but I believe that certainly I was talking then about the idea of these kind of hearings being held at TSO, like you said, just like CRC. And I thought that maybe GOL was going to be addressing that as saying, yes, it's fine for TSO to have the hearings for things that the town council needs to have that are in this area, just like it's fine for CRC to have things in this area. Um, so great on that. I, I, um, really appreciate all the comments everybody's made. And I think it's been synthesized pretty well as to where we're at. I do want to just extend, absolutely, we need to say something about, as Andy indicated, something about the effect on the parking system in general, in terms of the inventory. And then as an example, permit parking, right? Because that might not be an example people think of, um, whereas they often just think of either parking's there or it's not there, but they forget about the, per the permit parking part of it. I th and something that's in there that indicates the flexibility, right? So like you said, you don't just say, oh, your street is X wide, read this document, forget it, you're done. Like that's the end of the conversation. There needs to be a way that they can say, yes, I know that's the way it's written, but what else can we do? It sounds like, and, and I appreciate the way you tried to describe this at the end of the report that you're taking, that we've given up on the idea of residents going to TAC that even though, yes, that was my long ago select board hat that thought that's what I wanted to, one of the things I wanted to do was to field all these questions. You're saying, based on your description here, that they're not an elected body. This should be something we should be responsive to. So we'll ask for their advice and we will definitely always ask for their advice, but we will not send people to them first. That part of their, they need to, we need to fix their charge. They don't get to fix their own charge. We need to fix their charge that indicates that's no longer a thing that they're going to try and develop a responsive system for this kind of thing that you're saying it needs to come to the town council, which then leads us to the question of, the concern that was brought to us in public comment tonight, and I know we don't respond at public comment, but then we talk later about whether or not we need to address it in some fashion. That email came to the full town council. It was talked about tonight at TSO. Are we expecting that that individual has to now go to town council, public comment, ask for, of course, we can't respond at town council, but then the town council has to later in the meeting say, yes, we want the TSO to work on that. Or can the TSO just say, hey, we're gonna work on this as an example as we work through this policy. Because in theory, committees are supposed to be able to do things that are within their purview, even if the, t even if the town council hasn't told them to do it. So from a practical standpoint, I wanna know how we're gonna address Ms. Griswold's concern because this is not the first time it's come up about Kendrick Place. It came up well before the town council. Um, Obviously, you know, the if we're going to cut out TAC, which is in terms of gatekeepers, right, they're not going to be gatekeepers, already went to DPW. DPW didn't say, oh, yes, I can just solve this, boom, or I will bring this proposal to town council. So we have to do something with to address that concern because it's been brought to us as a public safety concern, not just a con not just an inconvenience. So that's part of this. And then in terms of the broader picture, again, to circle back to that, is we don't have very many policies. The ones that we do have aren't particularly well written. And it's one of the wonderful things with committees. And we have to decide what does a policy look like. And I really glommed onto something you said near the end, George, where you were talking about if there's a separate document. Because to me, a policy, we all have different views, but to me, this policy is too long and too detailed about, you know either it fits this or it doesn't, either it fits this or it doesn't, or maybe there's some looser thing. Maybe our policy part is shorter and the idea is that it's an appendix, right? And then that might, the appendix part might change over time. And that's something like the TSOs involved in bringing that appendix back to the town council when it needs to change, rather than having this big long policy that every time TSO realizes it's not working, we have to take it back to the town council to change the overall policy. Maybe there's a way to make the policy part shorter, town council approved and the rest of it's TSO with town council understanding this is why TSO is bringing stuff to town council because they follow, TSO has followed this plan. I hope that makes some sense. Yeah, if I may respond, Evan. Um, thank you. Um, there is a rule of 
uh, ROP uh, change that's being proposed. It's in your packet. You may not have had a chance to even look at it yet. And all it does is it just says the council has the authority to uh, ass assign public hearings to whatever uh, council committee it wishes. Um, so the council can right, go ahead and just do that. Um, this sort of, you know, what happens when a citizen comes, <clears throat> it could be automatic referral. Um, the council president could simply, it's a parking request, parking change, it just gets automatically referred to TSO, just like GOL gets stuff constantly from Lynn relating to proclamations and resolutions. She doesn't bring it to the council. Just once the council has made the decision that these kinds of things go to TSO, um, even right now, given TSO's charge, I think she could probably go ahead and do it anyway, automatic referral to us, and then we do what we're supposed to do. Um, the larger question of whether we can make this shorter, I'm gonna have to really think hard about that. Um, I hear you, um, but there's a lot of stuff in this that, that it's important that, well, yeah, I have to think hard about it because it's just things in here that I think re people really need to know that this is sort of the policy we follow. On the one hand, it's, it lives in TSO, so maybe it just is a TSO thing. And the, the council policy is just saying something like, these kinds of issues go to TSO and TSO deals with them and they hold the public hearings. So let me think about that. Maybe that's all the policy statement we need from the council and the rest of this is an internal document. Thank you, George. I think that's a that's an interesting point. In many ways, it, it, it feels as though, um, well, not to bring this up because it was controversial, but how OCA had its internal process of evaluating things. And now, uh, obviously, that's become a council-wide thing, but this is different. Uh, we did. I just, just want to throw out, so um, we did, as a council, vote to designate TSO to hold those public hearings already. I believe, yes. Um, yeah. So I was a little confused by that question because that's already been done. So is there something ad additional you're referring to? I think I'm just not, go ahead, Alyssa, I'm sorry. I, I think that was just one of, I mean, like George said, he's been working on this for a long time. And right. I think that's just a portion he didn't get a chance to update because like, why bother? But, but in addition to, to what George said, right? We did vote that as I thought I remembered, but it's gonna be added to the rules of procedure in a more generic way. And so we can just, you know, reference it should be in some place in here reference. that, that yeah. we're already doing it. Yeah. But because yes, you're right, George. Just as you wrote, it's a good idea. <laughs> the town council, right. agreed, it's a good idea. But yeah, that that separation. It may be that we're better off having a short policy. But then this is as a town council policy. But this is TSO's procedure, and you know that can always be questioned, right? What's TSO's procedure? But having all this written down in a procedure is incredibly important. So I'm not, I don't want you to lose any of it. I'm just talking about putting it in different buckets. So yeah, maybe it does become an internal document for this committee and I'll discuss with Lynn, but maybe the, uh, it's already been done. Maybe we really don't need anything more than what has been done. The real question is for us as a committee, how we want to now handle this. And that's what this document is about. Right. So I so the, there's a couple logistical questions that come up here. So if it's a policy of the council, obviously needs to be voted on by the full council, have two discussions and all of that. If it's an internal document, then it's an internal document, although we would still want to make sure the council is well aware of what we're doing. Um, to me, you know, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, this this document um, is really two different things, right? It's evaluation criteria and, and guidance on how to make a decision, but then it's also the process. And I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with the criteria part. And I was curious to hear if Guilford had any concerns and it sounds like he does not. Um, and I'm sure if he thinks of some, he'll let us know. And so that part I'm pretty comfortable with. I'm still not completely clear on the process part of things. So, it, and that's where I think some guidance on a council policy will, will be useful because I think the council will wanna know if someone emails and says, I'm having parking issues on my street, is TSO just gonna take that up and make a recommendation or does the council want to discuss whether or not to refer to TSO? I think that's an important point. Um, I think deciding whether what triggers 
our review is also an important point. If we get one email from one person who says there's too many cars on my street, do we go through this process that, you know, how, how does that happen? Those are actually the things I'm more concerned about. And so I would, I agree with George. I'd like to see us move somewhat quickly on this because this has been sitting out. George has been having this sit with him for quite a long time, but as he noted, this all started with the Lincoln Ave um, parking request that was, I don't even know what that happened. We were meeting in person, so it must've been a long time ago. Um, and so at the, we decided about a year ago to table the discussion around the specific Lincoln Ave parking request so that we could pursue a townwide residential parking policy. And one of the ways in which we justified that was that we were going into fall 2020 where we knew classes would be primarily remote. We knew the campus would be at reduced capacity. The campus is now reopened. And so I expect that the residents of Lincoln Ave are now wondering again, what's happening with that. And so it seems to me that a good use of our time would be to try to, um, since it doesn't sound like there's a whole lot more work to do on the policy part of it, although perhaps a little bit more on the process part of it, but we do technically have an outstanding referral about Lincoln Ave that we haven't fully dealt with, we just tabled. It seems to make sense to me for us to, uh, and I'm happy to hear comments on this, for us to work on finalizing this policy, figure out whose policy it is, and then test it perhaps on that Lincoln Ave referral and also on Kendrick Place since we've heard um, the concern in email and in public comment today and because this has been a longstanding um, concern. And so to me, the next step would be for George to bring back a revised version um, that looks a little bit more like a policy and that separates out the process from the criteria um, for us to have that discussion, but also figure out, and this can also be a conversation, as George said, with, with the president um, about whether we want to bring this to the council or not, but whether or not this is a council policy or a TSO policy. Is that, uh, I, is that where we're all at? George. That's certainly where I'm at. Um, and I'm very much leaning toward the idea that this is an internal policy document that we are perfectly happy to share with the council, but we create it because we're given the job of dealing with it. Then we report back to the council and then they make their decision. They have the final say. We're just crafting a, a policy that will govern how we review these sorts of things. We already have been given the authority by the previous vote of the council. So um, I will check this with Lynn, but I think what I will bring back to you, unless I hear otherwise from the rest of you, is really a document as an internal document about how we would deal with this. And I will clarify with Lynn whether she feels there's anything more needed uh, from the council officially, other than just a report from TSO at some point that notifies the council that, you know, uh, we now have created our internal policy and we're happy to share it with you. Um, and we're open for business. Alyssa. Couldn't unmute trying to do too many documents at the same time. So there's that separate document TSO public way review process that's got eight steps. So it feels like that's a shorter version of a portion of this policy. Not sure how else George might be seeing that. So I think that we probably do have something that we need to take back to the town council at some point, although it may not be immediately, that addresses the question that I think we've each touched on in one way or another about when, you know, we already said, oh, we can use this for Lincoln, we could use this for Kendrick Place. But when we get the next request, right? And is it a single email? Are we, are we, please tell me we are not having people sign petitions, please tell me we are not doing that. Um, that all their neighbors are telling us to do something a certain way. I think the town council probably does need to have something that says, you know, when a question about a public way comes up, either the town council needs to informally agree that that's just automatically gonna go to TSO and TSO will wrestle with, hey, do we think this is one person? Do we think this is a whole street? Do we think this actually impacts three streets that are really close together? And then we tell the council, 
or something. But I think that somehow the bottom, one of the bottom lines we need to address here is still the fact that when somebody comes to public comment or writes us an email as town counselors, right, rather than as TSO, we don't know what to do with it. And so if it comes back to, like George said very clearly with uh, proclamations and resolutions, right, Lynn just automatically says, off you go, off to GOL. If it's the same for these things and we say, we say off you go, then I think we'll just need to add more information at some point, not necessarily this revision, about how we as a TSO decide how many, how much effort we're going to put into any individual requests like that, right? Like how soon we'll do it, if we'll table it, if we'll say it's regarding something else, whatever. But we just need to be clear with the council what's going to happen. And so if Lynn just says, as president, just says to George, yeah, if, if that's what you want to do, yeah, I'll just send every public way request over to you, just like I do with resolutions and proclamations to you. All. Fine, done. We don't have to write anything down. I guess that's okay, unless it feels like it needs to be in a rule of procedure. Any further, uh, Andy? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is a tough one because we really are touching on something that means a lot to a lot of people for good reason. Uh, when you have a short street like Kendrick, one homeowner is a significant percentage of the people living on the street, and but also can have a significant percentage of the problems that exist um, on that street. So um, hearing from the one person uh, in and of itself is significant. Uh, and it's sort of hard to come up with policy that's, that therefore applies to all streets. Um, the other, th other thing that's been in the last comments that was a little bit uh, going beyond just parking is, you know, are we talking about all traffic issues and, all, and other kinds of concerns? Because um, they arise all the time. And uh, I give you as an example, I think Alyssa was there too at the District 5 meeting the other day. There was a substantial discussion about both Middle Street and the area around the, um, that is the South Common, or the South Amherst Common, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, so those were um, issues that were beyond, part that weren't parking, but they were still getting back into this whole thing of traffic related issues that come before the council used to come up with a select board. George. So this is about parking. That's it. What evolves in the future? I don't know, but this is just about parking. And that's all I really want to, to tackle at this point. Um, the other thing is that it, Alyssa mentioned the, the process that I outlined and put in I don't know, maybe it made it into the, uh, the official packet tonight. I, I, I know I put it on SharePoint at one point or I shared it somewhere, but it's eight steps that kind of, I'm just an, a sort of a notion of how we actually go about a process. And the key point is the public hearing. And the question will always be, no matter what we're dealing with. So with Kendrick Place, if we actually take it on, we will have to have a public hearing. If we take on Lincoln, again, we will have to have a public hearing. And the decision that will be made by whatever, whoever's on TSO at that point is, is this rise to the level of we want to have a public hearing. And we may decide it doesn't, and that's where it dies. Now, citizens or residents may be unhappy, but now they know who to be unhappy with. It's those five SOBs on TSO. It's not Guilford. It's not Paul. We are the ones that were elected. We're responsible for the public way. And if we decide in our infinite wisdom that this just doesn't rise to the level of requiring a public hearing and us taking it seriously. We have to live with the heat. Um, so that would be kind of my argument for this. Um, that's why we're elected, it's our job. Alyssa. I'm not thrilled with that additional acronym that I hope you're not adding to our definitions section there, George. 
But um, other than that, yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, we we've moved past my long ago idea of this going to TAC because of their expertise. So they're not the gatekeepers. DPW is not going to drop everything every time one who may be a very large percentage of the of the group or you know a whole street every single person signs or whatever that's not necessarily going to make sense for DPW to drop everything and say oh well let's come up with a plan to take the town council I think it does make sense that rather than going directly to town council, that it goes to TSO and we wrestle with it. And if people are unhappy with what we, they, we decide, then they go back to the town council and they say, those guys are idiots. I can't believe they won't take me seriously. And then we have a different conversation, right? But this way people know where there is to go. They'll see all this criteria. When we say internal document, just, you know, we're not scaring anybody here. Like there is no such thing as an internal document. I mean, it's all public. public it's all going to be available to people. Everybody's going to see it. It's just not something that we're going to, every time we want to change a sentence or a comma, we have to get it reapproved by the town council. And so that that's sounding very sensible to me. Okay, okay so I think we're nearing the the end of this conversation so i'm looking at our calendar and my thought <laughs> on this is uh we're not going to be able to take this up at our next meeting i don't believe our next meeting we're going to devote um time to the amherst college wayfinding um and trying to get to a recommendation on that which has the potential to take up some time um, and we're also going to start having the conversation about um, the McClellan Street, uh, North Pleasant Street proposal um, on that public way. So my, my thought on this is that this will be an agenda item at the September 30th TSO meeting. I'm going to assume, unless he tells me otherwise, that that is a sufficient amount of time for George to make the the edits that he sees fit to make. Uh, and I will make sure it is in both the SharePoint, but also the public packet for the public to look at. Um, so we'll plan on returning to this for a larger conversation on September 30th. My thought on that is that we will then be able to um, possibly not take action on that, but have it included as part of our report um, to the town council for the town council's October 4th meeting so that they have an opportunity to see what we're doing and they don't feel surprised um, that we've adopted a, a internal policy, a TSO policy, we gotta stop saying internal, a TSO policy on parking. And then we can adopt that on October 7th and start planning out how we're going to apply it with some of the streets, including Lincoln and Kendrick Place, where we have heard uh, complaints. Does that sound like a good pathway forward? Okay, seeing nods, so we will plan on that. So then I'm gonna close that conversation and move along on our agenda. We have to do our minutes. Um, we have uh, August 5th and August 9th minutes that I know are in both the public packet and the SharePoint. I'm not sure about the August 26th uh, minute, so I am going to just stick to those two. Uh, did anyone have any changes to the August 5th or August 9th minutes? Okay, then I am going to move that we approve. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry, I was uh, too slow on getting to back to my unmute button. Um, I have to make sure I get the right minutes. There's some small points in a, on one of the minutes that I noticed as I was reading through in almost to the point where they're not substantive, they're more in the nature of what you'd call uh, Scrivener type errors, uh, changes. And I don't know if we want to deal with that level of um, changes during this discussion or how you would like to handle that. I'm looking for them now. I would say if they're not substantive, if they're Scrivener's, um, I'm comfortable approving the minutes. And then if you could just send me what you 
I, I read through the minutes, albeit quickly, and so I clearly missed them. Um, but if you would just send them to me, then we can make those changes. But since they're not substantive, I, I'm, I'm comfortable um, with us not having to have that as a conversation unless others want to. That's fine with me. They're really just like one word things okay. that, are, that are grammatical, not um, substantive. Okay, so if you could just send those to me and I'll make sure those are fixed before they get um, uploaded. Okay, then I am going to move that we approve the TSO minutes of August 5th and August 9th, 2021. I second. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, I'll call the question. We'll start with Andy. Yes. Alyssa. Abstain. I am an I. George? Aye. Okay, so that's three in favor with one abstention and one absent. Uh, as far as, so there are no items not anticipated by the chair 40 hours in advance. Um, looking at future agenda items, so I gave you a little bit of an idea of where we're going. September 23rd, again, we'll be uh, returning to Amherst College Wayfinding and looking at the North Pleasant Street Kendrick Park um, proposed improvements. September 30th, uh, the plan is to return to the townwide residential parking policy um, and also to take a look at the um, North, uh, North Pleasant Street improvements that are in North Amherst. Um, and then October 7th, we will return to the, um, the townwide residential parking policy and start talking about perhaps adoption and what the path forward would be. Um, our next meeting, we also are going to have to figure out when we want to set the public hearing um, for the uh, McClellan Street, North Pleasant Street uh, proposal, since that does involve uh, changes to parking. And so over the next several months, townwide parking policy and those two proposals are going to be our primary focus. Alyssa. I'm just a little confused because I'm looking at a document in SharePoint, in this case, um, the tentative TSO agenda items, which still refers to some of our dates as possible, which we know has been updated, but we already decided we're having the hearing on the 14th of October. Okay. So that, right. that's a done deal. So working backwards from there, right? George figured out already that we had to decide on the 23rd what it was the hearing notice was gonna say. I believe okay. is how George managed that. Yeah, we just need we need that document to be updated to be clear around that. I can I can do that. So part of part of this is the fact that I was had missed those meetings, and so I'm going on okay. the document okay. conversations. Uh, George, um, that was uh, we did not vote on it, so um, I created it as a, uh, a timeline for people to consider. Um, we certainly are free to change those dates. I thought I was thinking about their 14 day time limits and so on. Those dates made sense to me, um, but they're not something we voted on. So Evan, you can change them. Alyssa could change them or you could propose to change them. But that document does lay out a kind of timeline that when I created it made sense, um, but it's not something we officially approved. So um, I hope we keep to it, but it's something we can easily change because we never really voted on it. And you are the chair now, act, and so as you know, you may look at it and go, "I want to change these dates," and then just tell us. But uh, I believe you have it. I can certainly send it to you if you don't. It's been it's in SharePoint. Um, that's it was created just to, to guide us and sure. can be altered if we want. Thank you, George. Also, quickly on September thirtieth, uh, Guilford knows this. I think uh, it's a staff presentation. So on September 30, he will be presenting to us um, and uh, to us on North Pleasant Street improvements. Um, and then our task is having heard that is then, you know, to make a decision about, you know, what's next for us, um, you know, create what I call a decision points document um, and also think, well, who do we also do we want to hear from? Um, that's what September 30th is. Um, and Guilford should be, I assume will be, or somebody from his department will make a presentation on the 30th. Um, thank you, George. Andy. 
Yes, when we have the discussion about North Pleasant Street, uh, the section along uh, Kendrick Park, um, for reasons I can explain in detail, but will not but try to because it would be awkward to do so, I would um, see if Paul can um, ask uh, through Guilford that Alan Snow be available to the committee as the um, tree warden. Uh, because uh, um, an alert member of our committee has uh, made us uh, aware of the Public Shade Tree Committee discussion on this, and it seemed that uh, some of what was presented is contrary to what I heard in a conversation with uh, Mr. Snow. Thank you, Andy. Alyssa? Thanks for your patience. I was just going to clarify that it's the the schedule that George referred to that he's of course saying, of course you can change it because that's George. Um, but he made a point. We, we we picked those dates for a reason, and so we have to make sure that we can get the legal notices in right by those points. And if we're going to change them, then that's going to change the point. We have to get the legal notices in. So George counted for that when he came up with that schedule, and that schedule is in fact in the SharePoint for tonight, and it was in the 26th public packet, the same version. So it's been out there. It's just a matter of ensuring that we are really sure that we can get staff to put the public hearing notice into the Gazette in the timeline that the Gazette demands for us to be able to do that um, if we're going to make that October date still work. Okay, thank you. I appreciate all of these comments as I'm trying to navigate acting chair position after having been absent for some time. Um, okay. George, you still have your hand up? Just quickly, um, the Public Safety Committee should be one of the committees that we routinely refer to from now on or, or seek out along with TAC and along with DAAC. Um, that's something perhaps we'll talk about at a future meeting, but I think it, we're getting to the point where we're realizing that there's certain bodies that just as a matter of course, we would reach out to um, with these kinds of requests and say, here's what we got. Um, if you have anything you wanna let us know, please let us know and give them a date. That's what I did with Public Shade. That's what I did with uh, TAC. That's what I did with DAAC. Um, and so I'm not sure, I think Andy's point was that this should be something we always do uh, pretty much with almost anything. Um, it might make sense to have Alan present for other reasons, which is great, but we should always be reaching out to them, I think, for most of these uh, issues as a matter of course. Just Thank you, George. if I may, Evan. Please. Uh, there, were, there was something that um, Mr. Snow said to me in a conversation at the Kendrick Park dedication ribbon cutting that seemed uh, to be contrary to a recommendation that was in what was present, uh, presented to us as minutes of the committee, I think that it's really a factual question so that I think we need to come to an understanding of what it is that's possible to do. And I don't want to get into it further okay. um, with it because it's not on the agenda. Okay, thank you, Andy. All right, so we have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, but that's good. So uh, if there is no further conversation around future agenda items, um, then I, uh, the one thing I will say is I wanna, I wanna thank everyone for humoring me about meeting at 5.30 um, today. Um, given that we do expect Councilor Dumont to return at the end of September, and given that she does have a conflict um, with a 5.30 meeting, um, I do expect us to return to our 6.30 p.m. meeting time. Um, so just a heads up about that. Go ahead, George. Next meeting, though, do you want to make it 5.30? I don't see a reason why we can't. I mean, it's a small uh, nod to staff. It's a little bit easier. I mean, at the 30th, you're right. We're going to have to go back to 6.30. But the 23rd, I don't see why we can't meet at 5.30. Is that an issue for anybody? Darcy's not going to be here. And she will not be Russ, here. Yeah. So unless she suddenly announces she wants to be here, um, I think we could go ahead and meet at 5.30 at least one more time. Um, 
if that doesn't create too much confusion. And then after that, I think we'll probably have to go back to 6.30. Right. If people are okay with 5.30 for September 23rd? I'm okay with that. Yes. Okay, I definitely, I know I prefer that. And I, I know that probably staff appreciates being able to hear, be yeah. here a little early. We will have quite a few people here for our September 23rd meeting. Okay, then with that, I am adjourning us at 7.35 p.m. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm.